This is Far From Home. I'm Scott Gurian. If you follow this podcast on Instagram, you've probably seen that I've been doing a bunch of traveling over the past number of months, gathering stories from places like Thailand, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Algeria. I'm hard at work now editing everything together for my fourth season, which I'm really excited about, and I promise it's coming soon. But in the meantime, I'm coming out of my long hibernation to share with you an amazing story from a guy I met when I was in Copenhagen recently. His name is Thor Peterson, and you may have heard about him in the news because he just spent the past decade on this remarkable, life-changing journey. I don't want to give away too many details because I think it's best if he tells you himself. So without further ado, here's Thor's story. My name is Thor Peterson. I come from Denmark. I'm a modern-day explorer, and I recently explored if it was possible to go to every country in the world completely without flying. And it was. (laughs) Back in 2013, I was doing quite well within my career of shipping and logistics. I was on my 12th year of that career. I would be the guy who would fly in and out. I'd be on a project somewhere six months or a couple of years and then come back home and see everyone and then go out again. But yeah, maybe I felt like it was about time to settle down a little bit. I had just met a wonderful woman we started dating. I had just bought an apartment and I was 34 years old. So there really wasn't much in the cards that would set me off into an adventure into the world. But to be clear, Thor had always had a bit of an adventurous streak. I'm definitely competitive, but I think I compete against myself much more than anyone else. I'd done a couple of marathons back then and I was trying to improve my time for the next marathon I was going to run. I wanted to do a little bit faster. I have done some long hikes just to go out and push myself and see if I could handle it and come back days or weeks later. I once put a kayak in the water and paddled around one of the large islands in Denmark. That was an eight-day kayak trip from morning to evening every day. And I like to come back and say, I did this, you know, that I accomplished this. In January 2013, my father sent me an email and I was reading this article about people who'd gone to every country in the world. Then I think this was the first time I realized that you could go to every country in the world. I thought something like that would just be too time consuming and too expensive. You would have to be a millionaire and spend your entire life. But about 200 people had been to every country in the world, which uh, struck me like that is actually something you can do. And quite a few people had done it on pretty small budgets. And then I realized that no one had gone to every country in the world completely without flying. There had been a few attempts, or some people had traveled most of the world without flying, and then hopped on board a few flights. But no one had done it completely without flying. And if you hold that up against that, I grew up in a world feeling that I was born too late. I was reading about people who had done amazing things. They'd gone to the North Pole, the South Pole, the highest mountain, the deepest seas, inside dark forests, following the longest rivers. But most of that had been done and explored 100 years ago. So I was born way too late. And then when I discovered that no one had gone to every country without flying, somehow that just connected with me. Like, that is one of the last great adventures, and that's my chance to put my name on page 506 in (laughs) some little book. So he took that spark of inspiration, combined it with his background in shipping logistics, and began doing some research to figure out just how feasible such a trip would be. The planning process wasn't initially a planning process at all. It was mostly me saying that this is interesting, but it's not something I'm going to do. I was thinking I was too old, then I would come back maybe even with debt. I thought that just wouldn't work. So for sure, I wasn't going to do it, but at the same time, I found it interesting. So I bought a map and a blue pen and a red pen, and I marked out different routes, and I was trying to optimize the logistics of it. To the best of my knowledge, in any case, I started to wonder about how long would it take in terms of time management with about 200 countries in the world. If you spend seven days in each country, then you come up with about four years. If you spend a month in each country in the world, then it's about 16 years. So I was trying to limit, in my mind, the project to four years based on that. And the finances of it, I was looking into an average budget for the entire world. 
And I was reading different blogs, talking to different people. I had already traveled quite a bit ahead of all of this. I've been to different parts of the world. I've seen a lot. And I came up with 20 US dollars per day as an average to cover four elements, which was transportation, accommodation, meals, and visas. Then eventually, having daydreamed and told myself I wasn't going to do it, eventually I decided, well, you know, I might actually do this. And at some point it tipped over and then I started to plan. But if he was going to embark on such a journey, he decided pretty early on that it wouldn't just be for his own enjoyment. He wanted some good to come out of his travels. In fact, even before this whole idea came about, he'd started exploring how he could use his professional backgrounds to make the world a better place. Back in 2013, I was looking to see what kind of logistical projects would I be able to do in the future. And I looked at the website for United Nations and for the Red Cross and for Doctors Without Borders and some other humanitarian organizations to see where they were operating and what kind of jobs might involve logistics and where they were looking for people. And the Danish Red Cross, they had a section called ERU, which was Emergency Response Unit, and they needed a logistics delegate. So I reached out to them and asked them if they could use someone like me. And they could, so they started training me. Throughout 2013, I had a lot to do with the Danish Red Cross. And then on the side, I was suddenly planning this project, going to every country in the world. So I broke that to the Red Cross and said, you know, actually, if you want to deploy me within the capacity of a logistics delegate, then you might not be able to do that for the next four years because now I'm going to do this. And they said, that sounded really interesting. And then I asked them if they wanted to have some involvement with the project, because after all, the Red Cross is the world's largest humanitarian organization and found in pretty much every country in the world. And I was going to every country in the world, so there had to be synergy. And they came back to me after a while and said, we'll make you Goodwill Ambassador, and they put some conditions, and then that was that. The idea was that I would raise attention, raise awareness, raise funds, and then symbolically connect the Red Cross throughout this journey by visiting the movement in 199 countries across the world. So now that he'd worked out a plan, he was left with the difficult task of breaking the news to his loved ones. My parents, they split up when I was young. So I had to tell my parents independently. And I went to my father first. And I'd say that my father, he's the structured person within my life. He's the one that gets up early in the morning. He puts a little bit of money aside for a rainy day. And he's a voice of reason in general. And I knew that was going to be a hard sale. So I went to him and I brought a map and I was trying to explain the entire concept of going to every country completely without flying, that I wouldn't be back home for perhaps four years, which I thought back in 2013. And he was so disappointed. He thought that I was throwing my career away, that no one would ever hire me again. No one would take me seriously if I did such a thing. And I was really trying to sell that I'm not a hippie, I won't be sitting on a beach with a guitar and long hair, like this is hardcore logistics and bureaucracy, the project has value. And eventually he went, well listen, you're not a kid anymore, I'm not going to make decisions on your behalf. If you want my advice, then don't do this, but if you're going to do it, then you have my full support. And eventually he did say to me that now that I set my mind to it, I should go out and do it. And if I'm out there in the world and he should pass, he was 65 years old at the time, but you never know, then I shouldn't come back home to look at a grave. I should complete what I set out to do. And then I should come back when I was successful and put my hand on the gravestone and say, I did it. So I had that kind of support from him. And then maybe a month after leaving home, he was one of my biggest fans. But he saw how I was conducting myself, and there were a few articles and this kind of stuff. My mother was a completely different story. I went to where my mother, she lives. It's a small, quiet street. We are just chatting. Mostly my mother is talking. She's pointing out different trees. And uh, then I say, Mother, listen, I will be traveling. I'll go away. I might not be back for four years. I'm going to every country in the world completely without flying. And she looked at me and she said, I also like to travel. And she continued pointing out trees. <laughs> so it was pretty much like I told her something like, I'm going to the dentist or something like that. My mother has given me 
fantasy, creativity, uh, being impulsive. Like that's my mother all the way. Talking to my girlfriend was a little bit harder because there were different emotions connected to that. I didn't want to lose her. And I knew that there was a risk that we would be going separate ways. And we sat down and had a talk about that. And I warned her against long distance relationships because I'd been in such before and they can be hard work. It can be stressful. It can be difficult in many ways. And she understood that, but she also understood that we had something good going. And she said that there was no point in breaking something that was good, that we might as well stick together and then see what happens. So maybe two or three months down the line, things aren't good anymore. And then we go separate ways. But as long as things were good, we should stay together. I couldn't really argue against that. Finally, the big day arrived. On October 10th, 2013, after many months of planning, Thor set out on this journey that he figured would take the next four years of his life. But he quickly realized that this would be much more difficult than he had thought. I had unrealistic expectations from the beginning. I thought I was setting out on the greatest thing ever and that I would have full support and backing and everyone would be in awe anywhere I went. I thought that in no time I would have a camera team following me, trying to document it. I thought big companies would come in and try to get a part of it and sponsor and give me gear and all this stuff. I thought I would get really good news articles and uh, news coverage around the world. And the reality was that people hardly cared. I left home and went into Germany and the Netherlands. And the people I talked to, they found it interesting, but they still had to go on with their own lives, uh, school, work, whatever they were tied up to. And the interviews that I got initially were usually junior reporters and they hadn't been briefed about who they were talking to and they show up and kind of discover the story while talking to me and yeah, it wasn't front page stuff anywhere. And I thought, well, eventually they will get it. I got to 15 countries, 20 countries, 30 countries and I really never saw the attention that I thought I would get for it. So that was discouraging. And then there were the host of enormous challenges he had created for himself. When I set out from home, I wanted a clear definition. What does it mean to go to every country in the world without flying? My friends and I, we sat down and we created three cardinal rules for it. So it had to be minimum 24 hours in each country. By that, there's no doubt if I've been to a country or not. It had to be an unbroken journey. So that meant I couldn't go back home until I reached the final country or if I quit the project. And then obviously no flying. Any form of flight would void the project completely. And that's a pretty clear definition. But those are also some very strict rules to live by, especially as the project went on and on and on. The reason he discovered that no one before him had succeeded at visiting every country in the world without flying in a single unbroken journey was that figuring out how to accomplish that was ridiculously hard. Thor did his best to take public transportation wherever he could, traversing the planet by buses and trains, as well as taxis and motorcycles. And he hitched a ride on every type of seagoing vessel you could imagine, from tugboats to shrimp trawlers to high-performance yachts. But it took a ton of creativity. This world is not made for travel without flying. I mean, you can get around Europe pretty easily. Europe's small and lots of countries and good logistics, but... If the goal is every country in the world, then it becomes almost impossible to reach them if you're not flying. Even in the US, I mean, if you have a vehicle, you're pretty good off. But trying to get around the US with trains, it's a little bit of a hassle. It's not that well developed. Buses exist, but they're not always all that comfortable as well. But the real problem with traveling without flying is when you need to go to island nations and there are no ferries then you're pretty much out of options because you'd need to work out what are your alternatives. Are there cruise ships? Are there any merchant vessels? Is there a family or someone out on an adventure? Do they have a sailboat? Are they heading in your direction? Do they want to help you? You know, that's a big question. When you go to a marina, maybe it might be a couple that took all their savings and they put it into this small sailboat and they have their dreams of going out into the night and being naked on the deck underneath the starry sky. And then there's this guy with a hat and a beard in the corner. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's not a part of the dream. So it's hard to convince people why they should help you sometimes. It's very hard to convince companies why they should help you. Getting on board a container ship in today's day and age is nearly impossible. There's no benefit in it for the shipping company. It might just be a hassle and might even cause problems on their behalf. At one point when I was in Iceland, I walk into an office and I'm trying to gain favor with a shipping company so they can bring me across to Canada. And I talk to a woman there and she looks like she died 20 years earlier. Like her face had no hope left. There was no light in her eyes and that mouth had not been smiling for <laughs> at least half of her life. She really wasn't the kind of person you wanted to talk to about gaining favor. And I'm trying to explain that I can come and do a speaking engagement for free and just explain to the employees what I'm doing and so on. So. And she looked at me with these dead eyes and she said, you know, we usually have people who've been on top of Mount Everest come and talk to our employees. And I just felt a knife, like an icy cold knife, go into my stomach and that I was worthless and that the bubble burst and I'd been living in a bubble that I thought I was doing something amazing, but really I was doing nothing that anyone really cared about and that I was absolutely nothing in comparison to someone who'd been on top of Everest. And I walked out of the office and I spent a good 40 minutes walking back to the hostel just with this rumbling feeling in my stomach that I've been wasting months of my life and I've embarked on something ridiculous that no one cared about. I got back to the hostel and one of the first things I did was I googled how many people have been on Everest and at the time it was more than 5,000 people and then how many people have been to every country and it was less than 300. So then I was back in the game. Eventually I did get on their ship and cross the Atlantic, but I didn't see that woman again. Thor desperately wanted people to appreciate the significance of his journey and that this wasn't just some sort of fun extended vacation. In fact, for much of the time, it was quite exhausting. I thought I was embarking on a great adventure and I would just be meeting people and trying different types of food and seeing things and thoughts and philosophy and ideas and all of this. And it was. In the beginning, it was 99% adventure and 1% work. And then over time, it shifted and it became 1% adventure and 99% work. And it was pretty serious business. In terms of danger, the list is pretty long. It's confirmed that three of the ships that I've traveled on board are at the bottom of the sea today. I've been at gunpoint several times, one time where it was really serious and I thought that was the end of the line. They told me it was the end of the line. That was in the south of Cameroon and close to the border with Congo in Central Africa. Cameroon is one of my favorite countries for everything that it has and the kindness of the people and the beauty and the food, but you never know where danger might find you. I had cerebral malaria. That's the type of malaria that goes to your brain and it can end your life within a couple of days if it goes untreated. That happened in Western Africa, in Ghana. I think the mosquito got me in Liberia though. <laughs> you can definitely get it in a number of countries around the world. While recovering from malaria, and soon after having been at gunpoint where I thought I was going to get shot and disappear in a jungle in the middle of the night, I was in a Toyota Corolla. In that part of the world, they call them bush taxis. You can put a lot of people in a Toyota Corolla. I mean, you might have seat belts for four or five people, but you can probably fit 10 or 11 people inside. And then we were blasting down this dirt road we're in a jungle, and it's the first day of the new year. Everyone had been partying the night before, singing and dancing. Some people were still dancing this morning, and a lot of people were drunk, and everyone in the vehicle were tired, including me. I was tired as well. And then slowly everyone starts to fall asleep, and eventually everyone is sleeping. And I'm in the back seat, and we're going fast. And I see the driver nodding more and more and then suddenly his head just rolls over and he's out and then the vehicle starts going off the road and within a split second without thinking I react 
and I just throw myself forward and grab the hold of the steering wheel and I correct us back on the road. And the driver wakes up and he sees me there next to him with my hand on the steering wheel and he gets upset. But he's upset for a minute or two and then he realizes what happened and then he calmly nods to me like in acceptance and he takes the steering wheel and he continues driving and he didn't fall asleep again. I was definitely worried about going to some of those places that you hear about in the evening news. And the stories that we hear from those countries are almost exclusively negative and scary. A country like Syria, Afghanistan, North Korea. There are a number of places that I'll deal with it when I get there, but I wasn't too keen on it. And then early days when I got to South America in 2014, I was being warned about Venezuela to such a degree that I was severely frightened riding a bus towards the country and into the country. I'd heard horrible, horrible stories from other travelers. I mean, not from anyone with personal experience. Always someone who heard something from someone else or read something. And I had a wonderful time in Venezuela. I'm not saying that there isn't shady stuff going on anywhere in Venezuela or that everyone is having a great time in Venezuela. I'm saying that where I was and through my observation, people were kind, it was a beautiful country, I was served great food, and I had a great time. I was there for maybe 10 days or so. And through my experience, I wrote a blog about my visit to Venezuela. And then I was criticized afterwards that I painted it like it was Disneyland. I mean, I'm not a reporter. I'm not here to investigate. And I just shared my experiences. And everyone I met were really lovely. And I felt safe. Most countries that we hear a lot about in the news surprised me in that they have so much more to offer than what we're told about. When you go to Afghanistan, whatever you might believe Afghanistan is, you're probably going to be positively surprised. One thing is the kindness and the generosity of the people who are there, who are somehow surprised that a traveler is coming towards them because they're so used to military and NGOs and people that come for a variety of reasons, but not out of curiosity or for the sake of travel. So they will try to show you their country in the best light possible. Whatever culture they can expose you to, whichever food they can cook. In Afghanistan, this old man, he took me to a tree and said, look at this tree. We see that we have a wall around it. We're protecting this tree. This tree is said to be more than a thousand years old. This war, this conflict that the world has been talking about for the past 40 years is just 40 years. We have long-lasting history here in our country, and this tree has seen far more than anyone remembers. I went to North Korea, and I can hardly make people believe that North Korea has beaches. Like, it doesn't go well in people's collective idea about what North Korea is. And North Korea is my primary example on what's wrong with how we view foreign countries, because... It's so rare that you run into anyone who's been to North Korea or anyone who knows anybody who's been to North Korea. And yet they can tell you something about North Korea. And it's always negative. It's always crazy or it's negative. And people forget that there are mountains and cities and villages and there's culture and sometimes it rains and people fall in love and they get married and someone cooks a meal and someone says, ah, that was a lovely meal. Thank you very much. And life goes on. The framework of North Korea is vastly different from probably any other country in the world. And the people who live there might be unfortunate to live within that framework, but they are still people. And we tend to forget that. I think I'm one to help and defend the underdog. So countries that people look down on, I'll try to build them up as much as possible. The overall mantra has been that whichever country I'm in is the best country in the world because it is to someone. And as a guest, 
Maybe you want to try to view it through their eyes and look at what makes this the best country in the world. Is it because you feel safe? Is it because it's well organized? Is it the history? Is it the culture? Is it the tea? Like, what is it that makes this the best country in the world? And you'll find that every country in the world is the best country in the world. It's just dependent on your outlook. One thing Thor came to understand is that it's most definitely not a small world, as many people often like to say it is. You see, by not using airplanes, he learned firsthand just how big it is. The overland travel can be rough. It takes a lot more time. Some places the roads are harsh. There are some stretches. If you fly across, you're fine. You go from one airport to the other. If you take the road, you have to pass through 25 or 30 checkpoints. And each checkpoint might set you back. So it can be a lot harder, but it's also very giving. I have seen where countries they meet. I think that has real value. Compared to getting on a flight and then five or six or seven hours later you touch down and you've moved a gigantic distance. Do you really understand how far you removed yourself? I have gone from deserts that gradually became more and more green and then suddenly you're in a forest. I've gone from oceans that gradually became mountains. I've seen the globe change in its geographical features. And I think there's some value in that. Thor gained all sorts of insights like this from his travels, and he had some amazing life-changing experiences. But if he had to characterize his journey, I think it's fair to say that one appropriate way to describe it would be unpredictable. Because one day he'd be triumphantly entering a new country, sharing his observations with his followers on social media. But the next, he'd inevitably face some giant setback and... With that, moments of enormous sadness when he seriously considered throwing in the towel. I probably thought about giving up a million times. Sometimes a million times within a day. <laughs> when I reached the two-year marker, I was really properly done for. I'd lost the financial backing. I was recovering from malaria. My long-distance relationship was shaky at best. I was no longer motivated. I was in physical pain, I was in mental pain. I really didn't see the support or the backing for my efforts. And I was struggling profoundly at the time. And I was being denied everything. And I was in a world of mad corruption. And I was unwilling to pay any bribes anywhere where I went. And I had a really long road ahead of me. So I came so close to quitting. That was back at the border crossing from Cameroon and into Gabon. The thing is, I needed to get an invitation letter. And I had an invitation letter. And then, of course, the visa. And I had the visa. And then you have your vaccine card. And you have all the vaccines that you need. And then I think I was pretty much set to go. And I reached the border crossing between Cameroon and Gabon. And it was a full day thing. Usually it should just be less than an hour for sure but it was a full day thing i was there in the morning and in the afternoon they let me cross i got into gabon and i got to the capital libreville i did a couple of interviews in gabon i met with the red cross in gabon and i stayed as a guest with someone and i was trying to go to sao tome in principe which is a small island nation off the coast of gabon and eventually I find a vessel that can take me there. So I leave my main bag behind in Gabon. And I get on this vessel and I go to Sao Tome. And then the vessel is unable to return me to Gabon. It's not going back to Gabon. So after a lot of hassle, I find a boat that can take me back to Cameroon. And now all I need to do is cross back from Cameroon into Gabon, which should be even easier now. But this time they're not allowing me to do so. There's no real reason why. I sit there and after a full day, they deny me. I come back to Cameroon, they cancel my exit. And then I'm sent two days travel up to the capital to get more paperwork. And then I come back maybe a week later and try the border again. And it's the same story. And this went on four or five times where they deny me to cross the border. So we're talking, I'm spending months trying to get back in. Every time I come back with more and more paperwork and I print out these 
articles that they wrote about me where I'm saying nice things about their country from newspapers that exist in Gabon to show that I have been in there and that I'm not of any risk to them, that I'm really a benefit for their country. I'm liaisoning with the Red Cross in Gabon and I'm just doing everything I can and it's still not good enough. And then someone was supposed to help me and support me in that moment and I gave him a call and he just didn't. And I felt so alone in the world. That was like the last lifeline that I had. And I saw a taxi and I decided that taxi was going to take me to the airport. And I was going to leave my bags behind on the other side of the border because I couldn't get to them. And I would just cut that off as a loss and get on the first flight back to Europe and then connect to Denmark. And I would be home within a day or two. And it would all be over and done. No more. Because I'd spent so much time in that border area, I kind of knew this motorcycle taxi driver, Abdul Karim, who the police told that he couldn't ride around without a helmet. So he got a hard hat, like a construction hard hat, and he was riding around with that. And he showed up just then, and he saw me, and he must have seen this dark cloud over my head and like my eyes almost tearing up. And he just came over with all the joy in the entire world and he was speaking to me in a language I didn't understand, which he often did, and tried to cheer me up. And there was just no cheering me up at that point. Like, that was a hopeless effort. But he was trying. He was just there for me in a moment of distress. And I think within 10 minutes I saw the same taxi still parked on the road and I decided that that taxi was going to take me to a different border, to a different country. And I was going to go through that country and travel all the way around Gabon and then enter Gabon from the south instead of from the north, where the border guards and immigration, they didn't know me and I would beat the system. I'm not sure exactly what turned things around, but I do put a lot of stock in Abdul Karim. I think it was the human interaction and that was enough to go from that I was defeated to that they're never going to beat me. I will find a way through this. And that's what he continued to do, time after time, whenever his plans went awry, which they often did. If he arrived in a town and the local hostel was full, he'd find a tree to string up his hammock and mosquito net, or even sleep on the street. When the company that was his main financial sponsor came upon hard times and had to cut his funding, he sold his personal possessions to make up the difference, took out loans, and launched an online crowdfunding campaign. And throughout all the highs and lows, he somehow managed to maintain his long-distance relationship with his girlfriend. She flew out to see him 27 times over the course of his journey. He proposed to her atop a mountaintop in Kenya, and they eventually went on to get married. Oh yeah, and that four-year excursion that Thor had originally planned back in 2013? Well, it turned into a decade-long odyssey. What was it like to spend most of a decade constantly being on the move, not feeling kind of rooted somewhere? The nomadic lifestyle of it all has been stressful. Very few people realize how trapped I felt within my own ambition, which is a very strange place to be. I had a list of all the countries in the world in front of me, and I went from one country to the next, and I could cross off these countries, but that was a very, very long list. And you reached 30 countries, you still have more than 170 countries left, according to my list. And uh, when you reach 50 countries, and 50 countries is a lot, and you're going to feel that on your body. You'll realize that that's only a quarter of it. And eventually you get close to half of it, and you're drained for energy, and you have almost nothing left to give from. And you realize you're only halfway through. Most people, they go on holidays, vacations, it might be a week, 10 days, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. And sometimes when they come home, they need some rest from their holiday because they've been in and out of museums, up and down mountain tops and into the ocean and up and down the streets and they've experienced so much. People do gap years and after six months of traveling, most people are done for. They've met enough people, they've tasted enough food, they've seen so many things, they've had so many thoughts, packing, unpacking, packing, unpacking over and over again. They come back home and then they offload all of this and they start to reflect and then maybe down the road 
they decide to go out traveling again. And that's six months of travel. Meeting people who've traveled for two years is like coming across a unicorn. It does happen, but it's really, really rare. It's such a long stretch of living out of a bag. And the project lasted almost 10 years. So you can imagine the willpower pushing through and making it to the very last country. Finally, he was nearing the end of his list. He had just nine countries left, so he was in the home stretch. But it turned out that he was about to face his biggest challenge yet. In late 2019, I was in the Federated States of Micronesia in the North Pacific, trying to get to Palau, another country in the North Pacific. And I was collaborating with a shipping line that didn't have that connection. But what they could do was bring me from Federated States of Micronesia on a ship to Hong Kong for four days of transit. And then another one of their ships could bring me from Hong Kong to Palau. So that was a good solution. And I get on this ship and it's a 12-day voyage up to Hong Kong and I have no internet connectivity. So radio silence for 12 days. And we reach Hong Kong after 12 days and I'm up on the bridge with the captain. And the captain is wearing a mask. And he hands me a mask and he says, you better put this on. And then he tells me about a virus outbreak in Wuhan. And I say, what's Wuhan? I say, well, that's a city in China. And I get internet connectivity and I find out that that's a thousand kilometers, 600 miles away from where I am. Like, that's never going to have anything to do with me. People don't understand the size of the world and how local many issues are, and I'll be fine. And I walk into Hong Kong, and uh, long story short, the world closes its borders to greater China, which includes Hong Kong, and then eventually turns into a pandemic, and I end up spending two years in Hong Kong. Eventually, the world's borders opened once again, so he was able to pick back up where he left off. All these years of travel were starting to take a toll on him. I've been pushing for a long time. And I've been working really, really hard. And I've been putting a lot of hours into the project. During the pandemic, when I was stuck in Hong Kong, I was offered to see a psychologist pro bono. And I decided, why not? So I went and I saw her and I had a few sessions. And after the first two or three sessions, she looked at me and said, you are so close to burnout. You really have to take better care of yourself. And I wonder if I walked through burnout and that I reached the other side, whatever that is. Generally, when I reached a new country, I would be on top of the world. It would be such an amazing feeling of progress and success. And I would be so happy to take a photo of me smiling and share it on social media and say, now we've reached country number so and so and we have so many left. And that was true until I reached Sri Lanka, which was the penultimate country. And when I walked into Sri Lanka, I felt nothing. And I was aware that I didn't feel anything. So I faked the smile for the camera. And I probably took 20 photos until I had one where I felt that the smile looked genuine and posted I'd reached Sri Lanka. And then I was wondering what was going on. I was so close to the goal. Like, why am I not feeling anything? And when I eventually reached the final country, the Maldives, it was the same feeling. I didn't feel anything at all. I had a choice. I could fly home from the Maldives, being the last country, and then be home within a couple of days. Or I could travel home over land and sea, and thus closing the circle and making the record pretty much unbeatable. But also it felt like it might be better for my mental health to travel home over land and sea because it would give me time to prepare for my homecoming, for my return. And the last voyage was a ship that I was on board for 33 days. And I thought that that was really mentally good for me to be able to count down and follow a map as well and see where am I on the planet. I'm gradually returning home. I'm getting closer and closer. And I was feeling quite confident until three days before returning home. My mind flipped and I had all these doubts that I want to be a motivational speaker. I want to turn that into a profession. What if nobody wants to hear what I have to say? Or what if no one wants to pay me for it? 
I want to be an author, I want to write a book and share the story. What if no publishers want to do it? Or what if I can't write it the way it's supposed to be written? Or what if nobody wants to buy it? We're working on a documentary that's coming out next year. What if it doesn't work out? What if it's not good? What if nobody wants to see it? All of these doubts. I'm coming back home to my wife. I've been in a long distance relationship for almost a decade. What if it doesn't work out? What if we can't find each other? What if we're better apart than we are together? What if there's no press when I come home? What if there's no attention? What if nobody cares about what I did? What if, what if, what if, what if? I was having nightmares the last few days and I was all sorts of weird dreams and I was feeling so insecure about it all. Eventually, what happened was that we had about 150 people who showed up at the port to see me, which was amazing. We had foreign press come and cover it as well as uh, national press. We had the biggest news stations from Denmark come and cover the story and people were just full of joy and they brought small flags and they were waving them and the sun was shining for at least 15 minutes before it started raining and uh, yeah it was just a wonderful reception it was so good and it just blew all my doubts and all my fears and all my insecurity away for at least a couple of days that there was this high on coming back home and being welcomed in such an amazing way and the love and outpouring on social media as well was just spectacular. People were so amazing towards me. So there he was back in Denmark, 3,576 days after he'd first set out. And suddenly things were different. There was no more applying for visas, coordinating with shipping lines, or figuring out where he'd spend the night. Now everything seemed so terribly ordinary, and Thor had to somehow adjust. I knew that it would be a hard transition from living such a life for almost a decade and then coming back to a normal life. If you've been an expat for a number of years, you might find it hard to come home and transition. It could definitely take months. For soldiers that go away for a six-month deployment somewhere, they often come back home, and maybe they come home relatively unharmed but it takes so much longer for the mind to come back home. And for some people, the mind never really comes home. So I was worried about almost a decade of nomadic lifestyle, uh, going from one country to the next and trying to deal with the impossible over and over again, that if I would ever be able to return home in my head. And uh, I still worry. I'm not sure that I will be able to do it. But I'm aware that it will definitely take many months and it might even take years for me to fully come home. I think that within the process of coming home, I need some quiet time. I need to just be inside a room and maybe with the shutters down and just staring into a white wall. But that's definitely not what happened. I've done more than 50 interviews since I came back home and there's been so much attention all around the world. The story started to pop up in China and in Iran and in the US and Africa, South America, lots of European countries. It's just been nonstop. And I probably shouldn't be engaging too much in it, but I think I need all of that attention to build the platform that I want to have for speaking engagements and book sales and for the documentary. So I feel like I have to do the work, although it might not be the right time for me personally. I imagine when it all dies down and it becomes more calm, it'll be nice to just go for a walk in a park or go and see some friends and have a beer with someone. I figure that I've been on the highway in the fast lane in terms of life experience for the past decade. And I might have aged the equivalent of 50 or 60 years in less than 10 years. So people, they might look at me and say, well, he looks like he's in his mid-40s. I might be closer to 100 in terms of life experience. And that would be the biggest takeaway for me. It's who was it that came home you know, compared to who left back then. And that's just not the same person. Life in general is probably us looking back at the best and the worst. 
and then using that as the reference points. So say, I can definitely get through this because last year I went through that. And my reference points at this point are extreme. So if someone says you can't do that, <laughs> I have a hard time taking a person like that serious. I mean, do you know what I have done? Do you know what I'm capable of? I will definitely find a way. If I set my mind to it, I will definitely make it happen. And then people, they might laugh at me, but I know my own personal reference points. I know what it took me to come back home in one piece. I still wonder, why am I in one piece? Why do I still have all my teeth? Why do I still have vision on both eyes? Why do I still have 10 fingers? Like, from all of that, it could have gone so much worse. Do you still have a desire to travel or do you feel like you've exhausted that urge? I definitely have a desire to travel, but I want to travel as a free person. The project that I created boxed me in. I had very rigid project rules. I had a list I was waking up to. I had to go to countries, not necessarily because I wanted to go to countries, but the overall goal was to reach them all. So I had to go to countries. At this point, I'm a free person. I can say, I want to go to Italy. Where do I want to go in Italy? And then go and enjoy that. How long do I want to stay? I'll stay as long as I want. What do I want to see? So at this point, I want to go to Easter Island. I want to go to Galapagos. I want to go to Alaska. I want to go to Antarctica. These are places I didn't have to go within the project in order to reach every country in the world. But these are places of great interest. These are magnificent points on this planet. And I'm very curious about that. If you could go back in time and talk to the 2013 Thor Peterson, who had just come up with his idea to embark on this journey, what words of advice would you give? I would tell myself not to do it. My life has been at risk a number of times, and I don't think it should have been. You know, there's no overall reason to put your life at risk. So no, I'd tell whoever I was back then not to do it, and then... Probably that person would argue, well, you're standing here now, so even though your life has been at risk, you came out all right. <laughs> so I'll probably see it as a form of guarantee. If I had known that it would have taken 10 years, then I wouldn't have done it. If I had known that I was going to be stuck in Hong Kong for two years, I wouldn't have stayed in Hong Kong for two years. I'm an extremist. You know, when we use the word extremist, it's usually negative. I think I used it within something positive, but it is extreme. Not many people are going to make it to every country in the world. Why would you want to go to every country in the world? Why would you want to spend so many resources? Why wouldn't you spend a lot more time on the countries you enjoy traveling in or the ones that you're curious about? So because it's extreme, there have been some really dark and very complex points throughout, some very long periods where it looked hopeless. It has been mentally tough, it has been rough. A lot of what has come out over the past decade came out in the way it did because I didn't know. I was hoping for the best and the best took time. Since he spoke to me a few months ago, Thor Peterson has struck a deal with a well-known publisher for his forthcoming book, which he hopes to release late next year. The feature-length documentary about his travels is in the works, and he's signed with an agent to help him in his quest to become a motivational speaker. He's already lined up a number of speaking engagements around his home country of Denmark. If you'd like to hear more about Thor's travels, visit farfromhomepodcast.org where I posted links to his website and his blog, where he documented all 10 years of his journey. And while you're at my website, you could delve into my archives and check out my past three seasons of episodes. You could also follow me on Instagram and Facebook by searching for Far From Home Podcast. And you could drop me a line at info at farfromhomepodcast.org. I'm Scott Gurian. Until next time, thanks for listening.